You know, I really, by the end of tonight, well, this, this morning's just a warm-up, all right? So we'll just be fairly low-key, pretty casual, but we'll, we'll go into higher gear to, tonight because uh, what's on my heart is I want, I want us, I really want a move of the Holy Spirit. Anyone up for that? I, I want every person that's here today that, you know, before the day is out, that you have a moment with God. You know, you either you feel His presence, or maybe you hear His voice, or maybe you get healed, or, uh, you know, maybe you, you have a vision, or, or just, just something that, you know, and God just touches your life, so that by the end of today, you're going to think, man, God is real. God is personal, and God is interested in me. I think we, gotta, we, we need to have that happening in each of our lives on a regular basis. So if you're up for that, that's what we want to do throughout today. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, you are here. You're in this house. You're in this place. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, Holy Spirit, that you would just touch each and every one of us. Holy Spirit, that your word would be with power. Lord, it will not just be another message, but Lord, we'll receive something from the very presence of God, from the very throne of heaven. God, we'll receive, Lord, a word from you to our hearts today that's going to move us forward, that's going to change us, that's going to help us in our journey with you. So Holy Spirit, come. Come right now. Just settle upon every person in this place. Even now, let them sense your touch. Let them sense your presence. Let them sense your anointing. Father, even now, Father, as we come and begin to share from the Word of God, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab a seat. I want to start with Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where we read these words, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This, you know, was the day of Pentecost. The, the church, this is when the church was born. The church was born in the power of God. And the way it started is really the only way it can effectively continue. It is a, it's birthed in power. And so one of my favorite verses now is 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of word. Or it's not just in word, but in power. And I've been saying to the Lord over the last, oh, probably three, four, five years, I've said, Lord, I, I've, I'm done with words. I'm done with just speaking words. I want your power. Anyone with me on this? I, I want your power. <clears throat> you know, words don't do a hang of a lot for people. We just go away and people say, oh, good word, pastor, good, good message. But I want to say, yeah, but what happened? You know, how did God touch your life? What you know, I, I don't want people to come to services, they come in one way, and they just leave exactly the same. I think, well, what's the point of that? You've been in the house of God. You've met with God. Something should happen. Something should change. There should be some breakthrough in our lives. So that's what I'm really preaching for and praying for, and I'm going after this more and more in my church, and we are starting to see some good things. In fact, I even say to the people in my church, hey, don't come here just to do your religious duty of being in church on Sunday morning. I said, don't leave here until you've had an encounter with God. The doors are all locked, and you cannot leave till you've touched God. Some of them are still there a week later. But we need to get that desperation, don't we? We need to come with expectation. I'm coming to the house of God. I'm not just coming to the house of a man. I'm not just coming to the government house. I'm coming to the house of God. God is in the house. Don't get too excited. God is in the house. If God is in the house, who reckons something should happen? Yeah. So why doesn't it? Because we don't expect it. We don't reach out for it. We don't believe for it. So I read the story of this uh, young guy, and he'd just become a new Christian. And he goes over to the pastor, and he said, Pastor, will you pray for my shadow? And there's my shadow there. Pray for my shadow. And the pastor looked like, like what? And the new Christian said, well, the lady next to me at work has got cancer, and she won't let me pray for her. I read in the Bible, in Acts chapter 5, that Peter's shadow healed the sick. I think the pastor thought, I need to get that new Christian to pray for me, 
because here is somebody who still believes that what happened in the Bible can still happen today. Is anyone in the house that believes that? You know that fire did come down from heaven. The Red Sea actually was parted. Did you know that? You know, the sun actually did stand still. Um, uh, Paul, uh, Peter did walk on water. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the furnace of fire. Heated up seven times. They came out unsinged. Means God can get you through any trial that you face in your life, and you can come out without the smell of smoke. You can come out without bitterness, disillusionment, anger, and frustration, because that's the power of God. This book is still real, it's still true today. And all I'm asking God for is God, would you give me the book again? Would you show me one of the songs? There's a song, I don't know if you ever sing it, it's an old, old song called Summon Your Power, O God. Has anyone heard of that one? Summon Your Power, O God. I'm not a singer, but I sing that all the time. I say, summon your power, O God. Show us your strength as you have done before. And then I think of the Red Sea and the fire from heaven. And I say, God, come on, do it again. And I believe we're going to see God do it again in an amazing, amazing way. So one of the reasons I'm so passionate, you might pick that up a little bit, about this <laughs> is that people come to my church full of, with, with huge needs, desperate you know, some have got mental health issues, some are depressed, some are suicidal. You know, some marriages are falling apart, kids are away from the Lord, some are on drugs, others are sick, others are, you know, they come with broken heart, they come with battles. They walk in the doors of my church with massive needs, and I'm tired of them going out with the same needs, without them being met. It's time for the narrative of the church to change. And once that starts happening, Every seat is going to be full. They're going to be lining up to get into the place. But we've got to restore that because my Bible says in Isaiah 61, is it? You know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? To heal the brokenhearted, to open prison doors, to set the captives free, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I'm saying, come on, Jesus. Come on, Holy Spirit. We need you. We want you. We're desperate for you, and we're calling upon you. The goal is transformation, not just information. You know, information's everywhere. Just go on the internet. You can hear the best sermons in the world. But the, there's been a change, and the trend has shifted from just wanting more information. People are now wanting transformation. And I've been pursuing the power of God, I said, for the last few years like never before. And like yourselves, we're starting to see some things that are happening. It's just a trickle, and I want to see a whole lot more. But let me just give you a few of the things that have happened over. Uh, we had a water baptism service. So they're great, aren't they? Uh, a few weeks ago, and this lady, I don't know, she's probably about late 30s, maybe 40. And she said that, she, they, we said, well, what's changed in your life since you have been recently saved? And she said, um, uh, God instantly healed me of 24-year meth addiction. Who reckons that's pretty cool? Our nation, our nation needs a move of deliverance from meth addiction. Another person said they were instantly healed of alcohol addiction and smoking addiction that has changed his whole family. They finally feel they've got the husband and the father back. But another story that I heard that really touched my heart was this an email was sent to us. This girl came into church. She uh, came into a service, and basically she said, this is my last service. Once I finish the service, I'm committing suicide. I'm done with life. That's pressure on a service, isn't it? Anyway, in that service, God met with her, touched her life. The, 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 the desire for suicide went away, and God just set her on fire, and she said, I'm, I'm full of hope and full of future, and I want to serve God. Amen. Friends, that's the God that we serve. Amen. He's amazing. One more that I really love, and this one happened probably about five years ago, and I was just talking to the lady the other day in church, and that she, had a, uh, she, was, she got Parkinson's, and it was pretty bad. And so she reached out, and you know, we, we got, she got prayer and all the rest of it, and she said that God healed her 90% of Parkinson's. And she says she just got 10% left. And it's almost like a reminder of the incredible miracle. I was talking to her just the other day and she's just beaming in her face. You know, friends, God is greater than Parkinson's. God is greater than dementia. 
God is greater than all of these ills that are coming upon the world today. But we have a God, you know, who is more than enough. But we need to get this power of God really restored more and more into the church. Here's a statement for your church. Here's a, let's make this a prophecy for, for Elam Dunedin. The church, when operating in power, offers the best show in town. Hey? Who reckons this should be the best show in town? You know, I know at Foresight Bar, the Waikato is going to play Otago. Who cares? You know, they'll line up for, they'll probably play a thousand, ten, twenty thousand, I don't know how many thousand they're going to have in there. But friends, it's the day is coming where Elam Dunedin is going to be a better show than anything else that is happening out there. You know, you know this, this is not a big deal. You know, just get a couple of blind eyes seeing. Get, get a few deaf ears opened. Uh, you know, just get, get someone out of a wheelchair. They, I'm telling you, they'll be lining up to get in here, and this will be the best show in town. Amen. Can we declare that together? Amen. Elam Dunedin will be the best show in town. Come on, let's read twice. Elam Dunedin will be the best show in town. One more time. Yeah. Elam Dunedin will be the best show in town. Now, how many of you actually believe that? Three. Okay. That explains everything, doesn't it? <laughs> No, no, we're still going to go after it. We're going to still go after it because I believe the day is coming when that will actually happen. Acts 2.22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did him through him, did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Miracles were proof that Jesus was from God. That was his testimony, was signs and wonders. And God wants, that's the signature of God is miracles, and God wants to write miracles over your life. He wants to write it all over your church so you have that testimony. We must restore the power of God. I must restore the power of God, if not for my generation, but then for coming generations. I cannot leave a legacy of a powerless Christianity to the coming generations. I'm telling you why they will not survive. The darkness that is going to come upon the globe, it's already coming, it's going to be so intense and so severe that this generation will need the power of God in order to survive the onslaughts of the enemy. And that's why tonight I want to pray for this next generation and do what I can to impart something of the Spirit of God so they can stand strong when the enemy comes in like a flood, that they can rise up in the power of the Spirit, resist the enemy, resist the devil, and be triumphant and be a light shining in a dark place. We've got to raise up the next generation. We've got to impart to them everything that we can so they will be strong and they'll be full of faith, full of power, full of the Spirit, full of the anointing. Yes. Sorry for getting a bit excited about that. But we're going to do this. We have to do this. I cannot leave a legacy of a powerless Christianity and a powerless church. We've got to change that narrative. And with God's grace and by God's help, we are going to do that with his help. I'm sure he will help us to do it. All right, so moving on from there, the single greatest key, I believe, to seeing the power of God is prayer. Everyone say prayer. prayer. Aren't you glad I'm going to talk about prayer? Yeah. I'll try and make it interesting for you, all right? Which you tend to have to hear people say, oh, prayer, here we go. They tune out. Do you know the disciples, <clears throat> they'd never asked Jesus to teach them to speak or preach. They only asked them to teach them to pray. Do you know why? Prayer is more powerful than preaching. Prayer is the engine room. Prayer is what brings power to everything we do. It's prayer comes behind the worship. Is that more prayer, the, the, more, the, the better the worship. The more, more prayer, the more the, the youth ha things happen with youth. The more prayer, the, more, the better the preaching. Prayer is the engine room behind everything else. And that's why we need to learn how to pray. But here's a thought for you that I believe that, uh, well, here's a statement for you first. No man or woman is greater than their prayer life. It's a pretty scary thought, isn't it? But prayer connects you to God. Prayer is where you interact with God. And so if you're not connecting with God, you're not going to be strong in your faith and your walk with God. So I want to take you a step forward in your praying, all right? I'm not going to take you from five minutes to two hours, you know, if you're at five minutes, I want to get you to 15 or 10 or 20 or whatever it might be. Prayer is something you grow in incrementally, 
all right? And you build up. It's like we all have a muscle. We all have a prayer muscle, you know? And if you, if you, want, uh, you, know, if you want massive biceps like I've got, you probably can't notice. I don't bend my arms fully because it'll just rip, you know? If I, cause it, so I just come go that far. But if you want to... <laughs> I don't know why you're all laughing at me. Anyway, <clears throat> but you, you've got, a, you've got a, a prayer bicep. You've got it. It's there. You're born with it. God, God, every Christian has got a prayer bicep. The only question is, how developed is it? How de- Some people say to me, I can't pray. I say, can you talk? How many of you can talk? Some of you can't. Eh? <laughs> can all the, all the mutes please come to the front right now? We'll pray for you. Prayer is talking to God. It's as simple as that. So how many of you, you're going to raise your hands. How many of you can talk to a friend for 20 minutes? Yeah, you all can, can't you? So why would you talk 20 minutes to a friend who has no power to change your life and not talk to God who has all power to break into your life and change it and transform your situations? I think we spend our time talking to the wrong person or the wrong people. We need to talk more to God and see what God will do in our lives. But look, the point I want to make here is that you need to learn to pray now before you actually need to pray. Before you face a major crisis. I was talking to a person not long ago, um, and and they they hit a real crisis. This person was a leader, hit a real crisis, and they struggled to get themselves through it. And they confessed to me afterwards. They said, I had not established a strong enough prayer life for me to pray myself and my family through the crisis that we were facing. I remember talking, I hear another story of this couple where they, 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 a crisis hit the family, the kids, everything was just pear-shaped, and the wife said to the husband, honey, you, you've got to pray for us and get us through this. Do you know what he said? He said, honey, I can't. I left the prayer altar many years ago. You've got to learn to pray now. There are challenging times coming for the church. Hello? There are challenging times coming for Christians. The laws that are being passed in our land right now, you better believe me, you're going to know, need to know how to pray. And I want to encourage you to get sign up for 24-7. Get along to these worship nights, whatever it is, and start to develop your prayer life because the day is going to come where you're going to need to know how to pray. There was a man who was a Christian composer and everything went pear-shaped. His finances were going down the drain. He was facing debt as prison. He felt he was paralyzed down one side. Virtually couldn't move his arm or anything like that. And then, uh, and he couldn't even walk. And so he turned to prayer. He was in a desperate condition. He began to pray. And he thought to himself, well, maybe I'll just try one more time to, to write a song. And after he had cried out to God, he made one, one further attempt. And having done that, George Frederick Handel wrote The Messiah Consider the greatest piece of sacred music ever written. Imagine if he had not known how to pray, the Messiah would never have been written. Learn to pray now before you need to know how to actually pray. I've prayed myself through so many circumstances. I've prayed my church through so many difficult situations and trying situations. And, and, and it's, it's just a vital thing that we need in our lives because I think prayer just makes such a difference. And I've sometimes thought, man, if I didn't know how to pray... I'm not sure I'd be standing here today because I have faced some major crises in my life. And I'm talking about major, really things that could have taken me out but didn't probably only because of the grace of God, His mercy, and also the ability to pray myself through difficult situations. You remember David when he hit Ziglag. You know, his his own men were going to stone him. His, um, his, his, his family, his, his city had been burnt down. His children had been taken. His wives had been taken. He is in a desperate situation. David, he's at the end of the road. He's at the midnight hour. This was his ultimate crisis. This was his zigzag, they call it. This was his crisis moment. But if you read down through a few more verses, it says David encouraged himself in the Lord. David knew how to pray. David knew how to connect with God in the midnight hour. David knew how to find God when it really mattered. And we know that only a few days later, King Saul would be killed and David would be elevated to the king of Israel. But imagine if he never knew how to pray. 
If he didn't know how to encourage himself. I don't know who I'm talking to today right now, but I'm talking to some people in this room right now. And God is saying, get on your knees and begin to learn to pray. Sign up for 24-7. Get to these worship nights because I'm telling you, I feel in the spirit of God, the day is coming when some of you are going to actually need to know how to really pray. And if you, need to, if you know how to pray, you'll be fine. You'll get through your circumstance. You'll get through the struggle. You'll get through the battle. Take that as a word from God. I don't know who I'm talking to. I believe there's a number of people. And as I'm speaking, something's resonating in your spirit. And you're thinking, he's talking to me. He's speaking to me. That's the Holy Spirit, friends. Some of you came just to hear that. That's all you needed to hear. And you're going to be ready. We don't, look, when you can pray, you don't have to fear the future. Because <laughs> God can get you through whatever life throws at you. But we do need to know how to find God in the crisis and in the midnight hour. Just check my time so I don't run out of time. <laughs> I want to go on to faith. The real key to answered prayer. There's a couple of verses that I want to encourage you to pray that have really helped my life. And the first one is Luke 17 verse 5. Lord, increase our faith. I want to change that to, Lord, increase my faith. So I, I discovered this verse. It's been in the Bible for thousands, for, for many, many years. <laughs> but I discovered it more recently, and I've started to pray. I've started to say, Lord, increase my faith, especially in prayer. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, So I pray it most days. What well, takes me, what, 10 seconds? Maybe a minute if I say it 10 times. Lord, increase my faith. Do you know what's happening? You are very sharp. <laughs> you are very intelligent. Give her a crunchy. It's a crunchy. Can you catch? Almost got there. It's all right. I'll pay for it, uh, Pastor Gabe. Don't worry about it. <laughs> My faith's increasing. And I'm saying to God, is it that easy? He said, yeah, it is that easy. Do you know we complicate Christianity? Do you know how we complicate it? By just not believing what the Bible says. So when we pray, Lord, increase my faith, he will increase your faith. And faith is a trigger that releases divine power. If you have faith, you can almost get in it. Smith Wigglesworth put it this way. He said, I can get more out of a moment of faith than a month's yelling at God. So I can do the yelling at God. I'm pretty good at that. God, do this. God, do that. He said, come on, Tuck. A moment of faith is going to get you the answer. So I want us to do this together, if you don't mind. It's because I know that you don't like being spectators. You want to be participators, don't you? Amen. Hey. Yeah, aren't you tired of being a spectator? Spectators don't get much out of a service, by the way. Participators get something. They get involved, they lean in, and they grab something. So I want us to say together three times, Lord, increase my faith. But I want you to say it from the depths of your being and believe that God's going to do this for you. How many of you would like a bit more faith, by the way? Yeah, most of us, all right. You get this. There are going to be miracles, all right? And when you double your tithe, the second tithe comes to Church Unlimited, all right? <laughs> because the miracle came from when I was here, all right? Okay, just kidding, just kidding. All right, so you ready? Look, some of you, some of you are going to get an injection of faith right now. Something's going to happen. The next 30 seconds, something is going to happen in your heart. You ready for this? We're going to say, Lord, increase my... So close your eyes, because I don't want you looking around. Seeing what someone else is wearing. See what outfit they've got on, their hairstyle. And I forget all that. This is you and God. And you're just going to say three times, Lord, increase. And as you say, you're going to believe that God's going to do this. Are you ready? Let's go. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, increase my faith. Wow. It's going to happen. You watch. Next few days, next week or so. You're going to think, man, I've, got, I've just got a bit more faith for that. For that situation. I want to connect that with another verse, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you receive it, then you will have them. So when you pray, it's not just, oh, I prayed about this situation and stop. No, no. You actually have to believe you've got the answer, that you've received the answer. So what I do, pray, I pray all the time. Lord, when I pray, after I've prayed, I just say, okay, Lord, I thank you. I've prayed for that situation. And I thank you, you've heard me, and the answer is on its way. 
You know, I, I receive, I active, sometimes I'll just stop and say, Lord, I, I receive that answer to prayer. Lord, that situation I'm praying, Lord, right now I receive it. I, according to you, I receive the answer. I receive, I written this in a, a receiving anointing. But we sometimes never stop to receive, to receive the answer. And so often we don't even expect an answer. Do you know why people don't pray much? Because they don't see enough answers. Simple as that. If, 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 you're, if you knew when you prayed, your, your prayer would be answered, we'd all be praying, wouldn't we? You know, if you knew, you, God, if you prayed, your family would be sorted out, you'd be praying. You know, if you knew you were going to get healed, you'd be praying. We'd, but we don't see enough answers. But the more, once you start sending more and more answers, man, prayer gets the most exciting and awesome thing. And my, my strike, strike rate in prayer is going up, friends. It's, just, it's, on this, it's on this narrative. It's increasing all the time. My, my faith is like, I've never had more faith in my entire life. Why? Because I keep asking God for prayer, for, for faith, and I keep expecting Him to give me answers. I'm seeing more and more answers all the time. All right. Now, prayers of intimacy. I love this point here. You know, it's easy to try and build a relationship with God through a church, through a preacher, through groups, through friends. And you know, sometimes the question I want to ask is, what if we took away all the props? So there's no music, <laughs> there's no flashing lights, no sound system, no preacher, nobody else. It's just you and God. Some people find that they then have no connection with God. They're so dependent on all these props, all the stuff around them. So when they walk out of a meeting, or out, it's, it's almost like, well, you're on my own. God doesn't want that. You know, we get close to God. We get close to someone who's got close to God. <laughs> no, 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 you get close to God. <laughs> Don't wait for someone else to get close to God. You get close to Him, and I see what He will do in your life. A boy asked his father, he said, uh, he said Dad, how big is God? He see this airplane up in the sky. He said, son, how big is that plane? He said, oh, it's tiny, God, just very small. Uh, Dad, it's very small. They go to an airport, then there's, there's another plane right up close, and he said to the son, now, son, how big is that plane? He said, wow, Dad, it's huge. And he said, the size of God in your life is dependent on how close you are to God. The closer you are to God, the bigger He is in your life. The more you see of His power, the more faith that you have. So here's the key, friends, is get yourself close to God. I live my daily pursuit, my, and this is probably something that's been happening maybe for the last four or five years, my, the greatest longing of my heart is to get closer and closer to God. And so I spend a lot of my time when I'm praying, a lot of it is just given up to what I call the pursuit of God, the pursuit of the holy, the, the search for, for more of God in my life. And I'm finding that God is answering that prayer. And I'm getting closer and closer to God all the time. I've got a long way to go, but I'm getting closer. And I'm telling you, when the closer you get to God, the more fulfilling and satisfying your life is, because at the end of the day, you are made by God for God. And let's get rid of all the other stuff, and let's lock back into what we were created for, and that is for a deep personal, intimate relationship with God. I want to do something now, and uh, this whole area of this intimacy, I'm not quite finished preaching yet, but I would like you to stand with me, because I just know you love participating here. Why would we just watch when you can get involved yourself? Hmm? Close your eyes, please. And I want you to imagine Jesus standing in front of you. Because he actually is. He's with every one of us, without exception. You said, but I'm not very, living a very good life. doesn't matter. He loves you unconditionally. You say, oh, but I sinned yesterday. It doesn't matter. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So he's standing in front of you right now. I'm going to give you a minute on this. What I want you to do is, from the depths of your being, what do you want to talk to him about? What do you want to say to Jesus? Like He's just turned up. You're face to face with him, and he's saying to you, tell me anything you want. Your deepest need, your distress, your something you can't understand, some issue that you've got, why hasn't he answered it, what, what, whatever it is. So just, just get intimate with God. I'm going to give you a minute. 
roughly from now, you talk to him. Tell him your heart. Amen. Grab a seat. How many of you enjoyed doing that, by the way? Just give me a wave. Yeah, see? You're just learning to pray. Because that's all it is. That's the simplest aspect of it. You know, I, I spent a minute just talking to God about just some things I can't understand. So, God, I just, I, I can't, why did that, how come that's worked out that way? I never thought that would you know, it's, it's just a, it's such a good thing to do. And I know he listens with compassion and kindness and love. And he'll never judge you. He'll never condemn you. Um, so just do it more often, you know. Just do it more often. Just, just, talk, to, just talk to God. Oh, there's a guy I heard about that, uh, I just remember the story, but he just couldn't pray. And, uh, you know, the pre preacher would speak on prayer, and he'd just get angry. He always talked to us about prayer. I don't know how to pray. I can't pray. I hate these prayer messages. <laughs> and he'd send emails to the pastor. You may get a few like that. Um, but just you're know, really upset about having to pray so much. You know, why all this talk about prayer? Because he felt so frustrated. And so someone came to him and said, look, um, look, this is what you should do. Because he was in bed a lot of the time. I think he was um, not well. And so they, they, they said, get a chair, put it next to your bed, and imagine Jesus sitting there. And just talk to him. And so he did. He just did that. And, you know, and he really developed a very, very strong prayer life. So much so that when he died, uh, the, the, lady, the, the daughter or someone, whoever it was, talked to the pastor and said, the, his pastor was just said it's the strangest thing. Because she didn't know about all the, 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 the chair thing because he didn't tell them at the family about the chair because they thought he was nuts. They think he was nuts, so they didn't tell the family. But anyway, she tells the pastor, she says the strangest thing. When he died, he was leaning right into the chair. Into the bosom of Jesus. That's how close he got. It's a man who could not pray, who hated prayer, disliked it. Once he started talking to Jesus, everything changed. Is that a cool story or what? Eh? It's a, it's a pretty cool story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I just remember that one. So let me give you four reasons because our time is just about gone. Right, right, we're on high speed now, okay? I'm going to speak faster so we get through this. You're going to have to write faster, okay? Four, four hindrances to prayer, okay? Number one, it's not a top priority in our lives, okay? It's just something that we fit in if we can. Billy Graham says, Satan will contest every hour you spend in prayer or Bible reading. In other words, what happens once you get up, as soon as your feet hit the floor, every demons are released from the hordes of hell and they've got to stop you praying because they, the devil knows once you start praying, he is in trouble. So you've got to make it a top priority in your life. Number two, too busy to pray. If you're too busy to pray, you are too busy. So change, tell the person next to you, change something. Because they're all everyone claims they're too busy. Just change something. The first step with prayer is you just have to show up. The first step with prayer, you just have to sign up 24-7 prayer. Or show up to the nights of worship or whatever, whatever they're happening. That's the first step. So too busy to pray. Number three, this is a big one, is distractions. You start to pray, and what happens? A text comes through. Better check that text. Could be very important. You may have won a thousand dollars or something like that. You may have won the lottery. No, we don't gamble, do we? Jesus' name. And if you do, 90% goes to the church. <laughs> Just in case, all right? Just in case. And the other 10% goes to Church Unlimited. You get none. You get none because you shouldn't have been gambling. All right. 
distractions. <laughs> there's, a, there's a terrible mob. There's a mischievous spirit in here. Where's it coming from? We're only going to try and discern where the spirit's coming from. It's not me. I'm a holy, righteous, serious speaker. Anyway, so, <laughs> and, and then, so of course, once you check your, your um, text, then you notice uh, you go to your, you know, you start swiping it because something else comes up on the phone. And so you've got to check that. And then there's something else, you go this way, that way. And before you know it, oh, got to go to work now. Or what a time is gone. Distractions. You start worrying about the day. What are you going to do? You know, what are you going to wear? And uh, got this problem, that problem. You've got to sort all this. So your mind's everywhere. So here's a statement that's come out. Write this down somewhere. Pray until you pray. You got that? So you've got to pray through all the barriers. Pray for all the distractions. Pray through all the disturbances. Pray through the... I was talking to someone after the first service. I went to pray. And as soon as I started to pray, the phone rang. And then they're on the phone for an hour. I thought, my goodness, if you'd given that hour to God, it would have changed your life. Gave it to this other person. But he said exactly what I said. Distraction. The enemy has got to stop you praying. So pray until you pray. Sometimes I have to pray 20 minutes until I actually pray. Until I get through all my distractions. In fact, at times it has taken me 40 minutes to get through all the distractions. And I finally... <laughs> Getting somewhere in prayer. So pray until you pray. The last point is this, no plan to pray. No plan to pray. So it's not so much we don't want to pray, but there's no plan. So you're going to go on a holiday? You don't get up one day and say, honey, family, we're off on a two-week holiday. They say, where are you going? Don't know. Have you packed? No. Haven't got, what's the itinerary? No, no. What? You don't do that. Why? Because there's no plan. But we treat prayer the same. It's not that we don't want to pray. But there's just no plan to pray. So make yourself a plan. Get up. You know, we, sometimes we get up and there's no plan, there's no time, there's no place, there's no thought into it. Make a plan and start to pray. Mark eleven seventeen. as we begin to wrap this up. Um, my house shall be a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. The, the foundational identity of the church is prayer. That's what it should be. More than anything else, it should be a house of prayer. Now, most of us, including mine, we're, not, we're nowhere near that. But it is my vision, it's my mission, and I've actually said to my church, I want the prayer, week, the prayer meeting to be the biggest service of the week. I'd say it's the smallest, but <laughs> we want it to be the biggest. So here's a statement for you. The lack of prayer in the Western church must be one of the greatest tragedies of our times. It's a big statement, isn't it? The, our nation is held up by the prayers of the church. We're not doing a great job, folks, but we are going to change that. Justin Welby said, without prayer, there'll be no renewal of the church. Without a renewal of the church, there's very little hope for the world. If I could have the band, please. I'm on a mission to stir up prayer wherever I go and to see the church revived. We need to see a renewal in the church. A lukewarm church will never impact society. In fact, it won't even, it'll barely impact us, let alone society. One of the greatest needs, I believe, in the Western church, if not the greatest, is for the church to be renewed, to be set on fire, to be ablaze for God, people sold out for Jesus and giving Him everything they've got, willing to sacrifice, willing to go without, willing to do, willing to serve, whatever it takes, just ablaze with God on fire. And a revived church can impact your family, can impact society, can impact the community, can impact the city and beyond the city as well. We must get the church room. That's what tonight is all about. Speaking to the dry bones, prophesying to the dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then it goes on to say, as I prophesied, you know, they, they, the breath entered them and they stood to their feet, an exceeding great army. I'm praying that the Western church is going to rise to be an exceedingly great army. Gypsy Smith in his early 20s drew crowds of thousands of people. People got saved all the time. It was like he walked in, a re walked in revival fire. And they said to Gypsy Smith one day, they said, Gypsy, tell us, what's your key? And he said, get some chalk. He said, go home. He said, lock the door. He said, kneel on the floor. And then he said, with a piece of chalk, he said, draw a circle all around yourself. And then he said, pray this. God, start a revival inside the circle. Start a revival inside the circle. If your knees are okay, can I invite you to join me on your knees? And I want you to begin to pray and say, God, start a revival 
and start with me. Start a revival and start with me. There are people in this room. Pour out your spirit. There are people in this room. And I believe God is speaking to you right now. And you're beginning to sense the call of God upon you right now. For God to start a revival and to start with you. I'm not sure who I'm talking to. I'm not sure how many I'm talking to, but I believe there are people in this room right now. And the Holy Spirit is on you right now. You can feel His presence. You can feel His touch. And He is saying to you, I'm calling you to get into the prayer circle and pray, God, start a revival and start with me. As a musician, just sing behind us. Why don't you just spend a minute or so praying as we begin to wrap up this service. Oh, God. Start a revival, God. Would you start with me? Pour out your spirit upon your servant, God, I pray. Touch me with power from on high. Revive your church. God, revive your servant. Set me on fire. Start a revival. Oh, my God. Start a revival inside the circle. By your spirit, by your power, by your Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come. We're moving out beyond Holy Spirit is here, friends. Just feel his touch. Let him touch you now. Let him touch you now. Oh God, we worship you. Start a revival inside this circle. Yes, God. Why don't we sing this together? Cry out for a revival. Lift your voice. Thank you for your presence here in this place. And Holy Spirit, I pray you'd come right now. You'd come upon individuals. Lord, I pray for a prayer anointing. Right now, Lord, to come upon some, come upon all, in fact, here in this room. That, Lord, from this day forward, they will take a, a step ahead, a step up. God, in their prayer life, there'll be a shift in the spirit, a shift in their lives. Something will move. Something would change. And Lord, I pray for a revival anointing. Lord, to rest, particularly on some today that you are uniquely calling. God, to draw that circle and say, Lord, start a revival and start with me. Lord, all through history, you found a man, you found a woman, you found an individual through whom, Lord, you were able to bring revival and spread it to many, many places. So, Lord, I pray would you bless your people here today, Lord, with a, 
a prayer anointing, and Lord, also with a revival anointing. Father, I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Look, God is here. God's, God's moving.